Hello, I'm Matthew Gavidia here today on behalf of the American Journal of Managed Care. I'm welcoming Dr. Sonal Tully, clinical spokesperson for the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Hi, nice to meet you. So while COVID-19 is typically associated with cough or fever, evidence has shown that it can cause conjunctivitis and can be con transmitted by aerosol contact with conjunctiva. Can you discuss what current recommendations AEO have provided ophthalmologists during the pandemic? So what's interesting is that these are the that these are things that the American Academy of Ophthalmology says anyway, that it's a bad idea to touch your eyes, um, bad idea to touch things, surfaces, and then touch your eyes or rub your eyes. Um, and those apply even in this time of COVID. Um, and so even though we do talk about conjunctivitis with COVID, it's pretty rare. Um, they have shown that the virus has been trend, has been secreted in the tear film occasionally. But again, it's, it's extremely rare. And it's much more rare to get, it in, get an infection through the, the conjunctiva too. Uh, but certainly can happen. And so it's a good idea to make sure you wash your hands frequently, um, to not rub your eyes, not touch surfaces, and then touch your eyes, or touch your eyes and then touch surfaces, uh, because you can transmit any disease, not just COVID. So in patients with eye issues known to be caused by the virus, how can these symptoms be optimally treated in the home or through virtual care? So actually conjunctivitis um, is, a, is a perfect condition to be treated by telehealth uh, because the treatment is usually supportive. So, um, you know, we've been, uh, we've, in fact, I'm speaking to somebody this afternoon uh, via telehealth who's got a pink eye and we uh, can send them an eye chart to examine their vision at home to make sure that's not affected. Um, you can look at the patients and make sure that they don't have pussy or purulent discharge from the eye, um, but then advise the, the normal precautions you know, to um, maintain eye hygiene, to not touch their eyes, to not share towels. Um, and essentially it's supportive treatment. So you would use artificial tears, cool compresses, things like that. Um, and so those are, are perfect examples of things you can treat via uh, telehealth. So as the pandemic continues to surge nationwide, surgeries and treatments deemed non-essential have been either postponed or canceled. So can you discuss what implications this may have for patients who require regular eye injections or surgery? So one of the things we're doing and what's become important is as we see less patients is triaging patients appropriately, right? So figuring out which patients still need to be seen because they have problems that cannot be handled by telehealth or postponed for a later date. So somebody who's got a bad eye infection, obviously you have to see those patients, uh, but also determining which patients can then be postponed for three months or however long this takes uh, or handled via telehealth or some hybrid visit where they could come in. We're doing a lot of hybrid visits where now patients will be coming in, they'll get testing done and leave, and then we can discuss their findings over, uh, over telehealth or over the phone. Um, and so uh, figuring out how to best and optimally care for the patients is important. Certainly it causes a lot of I guess, inconvenience to patients because uh, somebody who's had surgery on one eye now needs the surgery on the other eye and is lopsided because they can't have it. And again, looking at those um, individually, patient by patient, to see which ones could be dangerous to leave for later. And those you do obviously have to do, even if there's a worry about um, the COVID. Um, and then some that can be postponed and it's an inconvenience, but they are safe to be put, you know, postponed for later. Um, and figuring that out is the important part right now. So have ophthalmologists voiced concern about the lack of personal protective equipment? And if so, how are these physicians adapting? Um, so initially there was quite a bit of concern because people were um, saving up the PPE as we were worried about supply chains and things like that. Uh, we were trying to keep the, the personal protective equipment for high risk cases only. Um, Fortunately, now the supply chains have been reestablished in a lot of cases. We've had donations from people. People have come up with innovative things. But initially, what we, uh, you know, everybody had put um, breath shields on their slit lamps, so they had a, some sort of protection. We were telling all our patients not to speak when we were examining them, to wait until we were three feet or six feet, feet away before we had a conversation. And so when we were examining, not to speak, obviously washing our hands before and after touching patients. We also made these uh, cool 
face shields that we could use to um, speak to the patients. Uh, obviously, you can't use those when you're at the sit lamp, but at least for the, the speaking part of it, we had protection for aerosols. And now we have started rolling out more of the personal protective equipment. So people are wearing masks as they examine patients, which is, you know, goggles and, and, and masks. So malaria drugs such as chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine have both become available for use to treat COVID-19. However, these uh, drugs lack substantial evidence related to its efficacy. So what should eye patients understand about these drugs? So, uh, you know, ophthalmologists are very familiar with these drugs, but especially with hydroxychloroquine, because we see patients who have been on these long term because they can cause complications with the eyes if they've been used long term. Fortunately, short term use probably wouldn't cause any eye problems. Um, so patients who are taking these medications should obviously continue to take the medications. Um, at this point, evidence is still lacking as to whether or not these are beneficial and whether the risks and the out benefits outweigh, which one outweighs the other. Um, there is some evidence that they do protect in early stages of the disease to prevent them from progressing. Um, so there are some studies that have shown that. There are other studies that have shown that they can cause some cardiac problems if taken in high doses or frequently. And so um, I think we're still waiting to hear the final determination. At this point, patients who are on those for other reasons should continue to take those and hopefully they'll have those available to take. So what innovations in eye care delivery have generated from the pandemic? So I think, of course, telemedicine has been the biggest innovation. Traditionally, ophthalmologists thought, oh my gosh, there's no way we can do telemedicine, right? Because we need to have the patient right here in front of us. And, um, you know, need, I guess, has been the, the mother of invention. And so people have come up with all sorts of uh, different ways that they can do telehealth visits, even in ophthalmology. So we're sending patients um, eye charts via email um, and then doing Zoom visits or you know telehealth visits via video or audio. Uh, there are various little devices that people have for uh, self-checking their vision. You can check color vision. Um, you can have patients, family members help to check how their eye moves or cover eyes and, and test things. And so people have come up with some pretty innovative ways to have patients self-test and also to be able to see them via um, telephone encounters or via video encounters. So it's been kind of interesting to see that ophthalmologists can adapt to, to this. So I think that's gonna be um, something that probably will stay on in some way, shape or form even after this, probably not to the extent that we're doing now. Um, but that would be very interesting to see. And lastly, do you have any other thoughts on how ophthalmologists can provide optimal care for patients? So I think uh, ophthalmologists need to, you know, for one thing, make sure their patients are safe, they themselves are safe, and obviously their staff are safe too, but also need to make sure that the patient's eye needs are taken care of. And so that goes back to what I talked about, um, triaging patients correctly, to figuring out uh, which patients can be postponed sort of indefinitely indef without having them come to harm, uh, but giving them the option of, you know, I can still check in with you, we can do a telehealth visit, so patients don't feel abandoned during this time because they're worried to, I've got this eye problem, am I going to go blind because nobody's seeing me? And so letting patients know that we will always be there to see you for urgent problems, um, but also there are other things we can do to check in on you to make sure everything is okay. And then seeing patients um, who do need to be seen, but then taking precautions, you know, telling patients, do not talk while I'm examining you. Uh, make sure you keep the, the distance as long as possible, uh, keeping the doors open so that the particles settle down properly, cleaning the rooms between patients, um, things like that, um, not doing unnecessary things, um, washing hands, making sure patients don't touch things um, after rubbing their eyes. Um, so taking the, the precautions, but I think, with that, we will all get through this, um, you know, individualizing the care to patients because not, not everything is going to fit each patient. But I think as long as we are uh, being, you know, have the right idea and the patients understand where we're coming from, I think this will, this will too pass. Thanks, Dr. Tully. Thank you. To read updates on AAO guidelines for ophthalmologists, visit aao.org. I'm Matthew Gavidia. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.